Airline Pilot Guy, Episode 155. Hello, you're listening to the Airline Pilot Guy Show, the view from my side of the cockpit door. I'm Captain Jeff, your host, broadcasting live from Studio 1005 in the Marriott Hotel in downtown Little Rock, Arkansas. In this episode, TransAsia's pilots are tested and retrained. A U.S. Airways E-190 lands nose gear up at Houston Intercontinental in Texas. A uh, little discussion about high-altitude ice crystal icing. And an Envoy CRJ makes an emergency landing in Tulsa. Of course, your feedback and much, much more. So get all settled in. Tray tables and seat backs in their upright and locked positions. Electronic devices powered on. Flight 155 is ready for pushback. Hello, everyone. I trust everybody is doing well. I am. It's uh, day three of a four-day trip this week, um, right now recording on Thursday, the 12th of February in the year of our Lord 2015, and I'm sitting here, a beautiful day, a little chilly here in Little Rock, but uh, a beautiful day here, um, overlooking my hotel room window, uh, and this is where I'm, I'm positioned right now for recording the show, I'm looking out at the Arkansas River as it's flowing by and watching a bunch of uh, migratory waterfowl flying by in, in their V formations. It's pretty cool. Uh, watching the, the cars go over the bridges here. And uh, as I said, it's a very beautiful day. I probably should be out there walking and getting some exercise, but uh, this is my opportunity today to record episode 155. Started out on Tuesday, ended up in... Um, in Flint, Michigan. And while I was there, I met up with Captain Tom. Yeah, Tom Wachowski. You've heard of him. Uh, he has uh, given feedback several times on this show. He's a corporate jet pilot. In fact, uh, he has his own podcast, privatejetpodcast.com, if you want to check him out and his show. And uh, he's also frequently on with Carl Valeri and the uh, Aviation Careers podcast, and uh, we talk about that in our meeting. And in fact, I took my handy dandy H5 recorder with me and uh, hit the record button and recorded this. So let's take a listen. Hey, I'm in Flint, Michigan, with someone you may have heard of before. He has his own podcast, Private Jet Podcast. May have heard him on Carl Verlari's uh, Aviation Careers podcast. He's the guy that answers all the questions about corporate flying. This is Tom Wachowski. Hi, hi everyone. I'm here with Captain Jeff in Flint, Michigan. And, and uh, good dinner tonight. That was a good dinner we had. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. And the beer was good too. Yeah. Tom didn't have any, but unfortunately, uh, I had to pass on the beer tonight. Yeah, but uh, I had enough time where I could have one, and it was a nice IPA. And uh, and and our we both had fish for dinner, mm -hmm. and it was wonderful. It's called the Red Hood, Red Wood Steakhouse in Flint, and it's just within walking distance of the uh, hotel that I live. Or driving distance, or for driving some of us. For you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tom lives about an hour north of here, and he came, he drove all the way down just to meet with meet up with me, and I'm so glad he did. We've had a great uh, a great dinner, but the best part of it was the conversation. That yes. We've been sharing. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to record something just to kind of commemorate. Our first yes meetup. inaugural yeah, and uh, I think we've solved just about every problem in the world. Now. I think so. You know, uh, tomorrow it'll be headlines, all, all problems solved. We're good to go. Yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> I feel good about it. I'm going to sleep well. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, tomorrow may have a different idea. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Tom it was great uh, meeting up with you, sharing dinner with you, and uh, likewise stories yes. and. Uh, philosophies of life and so yes. you need to check out Tom's podcast private jet podcast and also just do a search Tom Wachowski and uh, you'll see um, uh, his episodes that he uh, kind of answers questions for Carl Delary yeah they, Carl, oh you know because well, that's what, one thing that Tom and I share we have 
both been guests on Carl's show. Now, he has yes. been on it many more times than I have. Uh, I, I was on episode 29, uh-huh. and yeah. you were on like 38 and a 44, couple, yeah, couple, and, yeah. and I Carl always enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting yeah. about Carl, though, you know, we've done a couple of episodes together, uh, collaborate a lot, um, you know, over the telephone and stuff. We've never met. What? We've never met in person. Yeah. It, so you know, it's, it's always just been... Just that's the neat thing about podcasting is because when I'm listening to that show, it sounds like you guys are sitting right next to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I've always been... Uh, he's usually in Florida or New York, and I was always in Arizona or Michigan now. And, yeah. uh, and we've never met. We've come real close. But, boy, you know, the time you spend uh, collaborating with somebody or just listening to them, you feel like you've yeah. known them forever. That's one of the weird things about, and, and, the, and the magical things about podcasting is that, because I remember as listening to a podcast, not doing it on my own, is uh, meeting people in person for the first time, yes. and I feel like I've right. known them for a long time, yeah. all my life, you know? and they'll start telling a story and they go, oh, I've already heard this, right. I didn't know about yeah. that. How did you know about that? Because I listened to your podcast. Yeah. Oh, that's right. So uh, it's a different experience. It uh, is. It's a different experience. But you know, every single time that I've met somebody who has a podcast, and I can't say this about radio personalities or TV personalities or whatever, but every single time that I've met a person in real life, it's like they are the same person that you hear yeah. or see. Yeah, that's on a interesting. Podcast. You're right. Yeah, I've met a few other podcasters. You are right about that. I never yeah, we're not about putting on errors or anything. This is us. This is us. I think the medium allows people to be more real too. Yeah, They're not selling ads usually. Right. <laughs> yes. I love it. It's just uh, I love the grassroots aspect mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. And there are some that are very, very highly produced, and uh, and it's the same thing. You yeah. know, these are just real people like you and me, yeah. and uh, just enjoy what they're doing and have a enthusiasm and passion for yeah. it. Tom really has a passion for corporate aviation. That's my thing. And, and also in, in business and business related to corporate leadership aviation. and yeah. how do you? I always thought there's this uh, kind of the gentleman that introduced me to the whole idea of leadership. He said, uh, and, and he stole this quote from, oh, I forget who, but he said, yeah, how do you get people to do what you want them to do, and they want to do it? And so uh, that uh, that's kind of what got me going on that path, trying right. to answer that question. And that's the difference between. Somebody who is a manager or a president, and somebody who is a leader. Right. And we all know. You know if, if we've ever met anybody like that, you know. Oh yeah, we do. And I think it applies in the cockpit. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh, commercial, corporate, uh, just flying around for fun or flying gliders, like uh, the gentleman we just met. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to be a leader. Yeah. You know, to command that airplane safely, efficiently, uh, on time in your case, or right. just whatever it might be. So it, it, it's more than just business. I think it matters when you're actually manipulating the controls on an airplane, too. Right. In fact, when you look at accidents in the past, many times, a lot of these have occurred because there wasn't any leadership going on in that cockpit. And, uh, Even so our conversation about, you know, slowing things down. Right. Now, that's a... That's a you could classify that as a leader. You know, I wish we'd been recording our whole conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been Everybody a great Everybody would have podcast. all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, we don't want to take up much more of your time, Tom. I know you have to drive back. Yeah, it's great and, to meet uh, you. Today. i got to get a good night's sleep for my, you know, because I owe that to my passengers tomorrow. And uh, even though, well, I guess I'll fly one leg tomorrow. So, yeah, I, I owe it to my passengers to be a leader and to uh, operate the flight safely. So we're, safely. So we're going to go ahead and sign off. Again, Tom, it's such a pleasure Likewise. having dinner with you tonight and uh, hope to do it again more yes. in the future. Well, and it really, really was a pleasure. It was great food and, uh, as always, great conversation. So, again, Captain Tom, thanks for driving down and uh, meeting up with me there in Flint. And uh, perhaps if you're listening right now and you live in the Flint area and uh, I'm there again and have uh, an opportunity for a meetup like this, uh, uh, that would be fun to do again in the future. And speaking, well, before I talk about meetups, um, I, so that was m- Tuesday um, afternoon, evening. Wednesday was a nice, easy day. We just flew from Atlanta, I mean, from Flint to Atlanta to Austin, Texas, uh, the only state capital located on the Colorado River. Uh, it's a different Colorado River than the Colorado River that most people think about. And a beautiful day uh, yesterday in Austin. Um, Temperature was almost up to 80 degrees. It was uh, almost too warm. 
uh, my first officer and I headed out to uh, uh, go and do some exploring. And um, Jeff, my first officer, and I both love we both love walking. Number one. Number two. We both love great food, uh, especially barbecue. And uh, number three, and probably most importantly, we both love craft beer. So with that in mind, we arrived in Austin, got to the hotel midday, uh, decided to meet up about an hour later, and uh, we walked down to uh, the uh, location of um, a barbecue place called La Barbecue. And uh, I, I don't know, it's not really French barbecue. I don't know why it's called La Barbecue. But uh, it's one of those things that's in an area that's kind of a, a fenced-off area with uh, some, not really food trucks, but they're kind of like food trucks. I guess they are. They're trailer food truck kind of things. Trailers, really, uh, is where they fix their uh, or cook their barbecue and they sell their, their stuff. And uh, I was kind of worried a little bit by uh, the time that we arrived there. It was probably close to... I don't know, two o'clock local time. And I thought that uh, we were probably not going to be able to get any of that good barbecue because it was probably already going to be gone or we may have to wait in a long line. Well, when we finally got there and we walked up and there was no line at all, we walked right up to the window and uh, luckily brisket was one of the items still available. So we had a, a great smoked brisket sandwich and the that meat just literally melted in our mouths. Um, and uh, from there, we walked over to uh, a place called uh, The Ginger Man, I think, and uh, had a couple nice craft, local craft brews, and then uh, walked back to the hotel, took a nap, and uh, did some prep work for the rest of the day uh, and evening on the show. And that was yesterday. Uh, yesterday. This morning, got up early. Flew from Austin to Atlanta and then here in Little Rock. Another nice easy day on this four-day trip, day three. And here I am, sitting here in front of this window in my hotel room, recording the show. So now you're all caught up. Now, uh, speaking of meetups, well, next week I don't have anything scheduled, although I do need to fly. I need to fly at least a three-day trip or a two-day and a one-day or whatever to fill up. <laughs> Excuse me. Wow. Didn't, didn't uh, expect that coming. Uh, and... Then uh, the following week, I do have a trip scheduled, and it's one of these five-day trips that they just uh, put in our uh, trip pot, and uh, I thought I'd give one of these a try. And as I mentioned, I'm thinking that this may, might actually be too long of a trip to go on, you know, four nights away, Monday through Friday, but we'll see. But anyway, Monday, I'll be in Norfolk, Virginia, Mark Van Ram. Uh, contacted me and said, hey, let's do a meetup. And I said, okay. So we're going to have a meetup in Norfolk, Virginia on Monday, the 23rd of February at the Norfolk Tap Room, which is, uh, I'll have the uh, address or the link to the uh, website uh, in the um, show notes, but it's very close to where I stay at the uh, Waterside Hotel, uh, the Sheraton, I believe. And uh, we're going to do that starting around 5 o'clock, and uh, hopefully not too late because I have to get up pretty early the next morning. Uh, again, uh, meet up in Norfolk, Virginia, so if you're in the area and you're listening to my voice right now, uh, come out and uh, hang out with Mark Van Ram and I at the Norfolk Tap Room, February 23rd, at starting at 5 o'clock. Uh, the next day, I'll be in St. Louis, and I get in very early. I get in like 9 o'clock in the morning, should be at the hotel by about 10 o'clock in the morning, and that's the day I'll try to record. Uh, I hopefully will record that week's episode because I have so much time there, or maybe I'll be just spending time uh, preparing for it. But anyway, regardless, I um, will be holding another meetup in St. Louis, uh, location to be determined in time. Uh, so if you're listening to me right now and you live in the St. Louis area, um, you know, and you, if you have some good ideas, someplace close to where I'm staying, which is right there at the Arch uh, in the downtown area, uh, let me know and we'll uh, set something up. All right. Now, moving on, let's talk about the 
Coffee Fund. Johnny, how much more coffee? No thanks. I love coffee, I love tea. I love my APG community members who donate to my coffee fund. Yes, the coffee fund. I, I love all of you, you know, regardless of whether you donate to the coffee fund or not. So just to be clear. But if you'd like to help out with helping me offset some of the expenses of doing the show, you can do that by being a contributor to the APG Coffee Fund. And you can find information about it on the website, airlinepilotguy.com slash coffee. And since the last show, uh, using the PayPal, the classic method, we have John Freeman, Jeff and Anissa Moeller, Rich McKinney, Sean Christian, and Tracy White. And I have a few new patrons using the Patreon uh, option for donating to the coffee fund. It's kind of like a tip jar kind of thing. Give me a little bit of money per episode. And uh, Tiffany Walsh, Anthony Tibbs, Ken Hayes, and Armando Reynal have uh, donated. And you, you might recognize some of those names. Uh, most, if not all of you, have been not only contributors in a monetary way, but also in a feedback way. So uh, great to see all of you new patrons and um, coffee fund donors. And uh, again, if you want to find out uh, more about the uh, coffee fund, head over to airlinepilotguy.com slash coffee. And now it's time for the news. Okay, on the last show, we talked about the TransAsia Flight 235 crash in Taiwan. Uh, and I read this headline just a few days after that. Taiwanese airline TransAsia Airways says it is canceling 90 flights so that its pilots can attend training after one of its planes crashed on Wednesday. Flight 235 plunged into a river in the capital, Taipei, killing at least 40 of the 58 people on board. Officials are probing why both plane engines were off during the crash. Data suggests that the pilots, who are among the dead, may have shut one engine off after the other lost power. Taiwan's Civil Aeronautics Administration has ordered retraining for all TransAsia pilots flying its ATR fleet. In a quote from Trans Airways, uh, all 71 ATR pilots will take part in proficiency, proficiency tests carried out by the CAA and third-party professionals for an estimated four days. Uh, the aviation regulator has also ordered engine and fuel system checks on the remaining 22 ATR-manufactured planes currently in active service on the island. Uh, the main pilot could be heard on cockpit voice recordings saying that the engine had experienced a flameout which uh, can occur when the fuel supply to the engine is interrupted. Uh, let's see. The BBC's Cindy Sui says accident investigators will soon determine whether or not the deadly crash was mechanical or human error. However, uh, they said that data has shown that the engine had, in fact, been moved into idle mode. Seconds later, the pilots shut down the left engine, meaning neither engine was producing any power. A restart was attempted, but the plane crashed 72 seconds later. Officials said it was unclear why the left engine had been turned off, especially as the plane, an ATR-72-600, is able to fly with just one functioning engine, 
and we've talked about this before, any airplane, any air transport category airplane is certificated or certified to fly with only one engine operating. Uh, so as long as there are no other circumstances that might contribute to its lack of success, or as long as the pilot at the controls or pilots at the controls know how to handle an engine out situation. And that's why we practice those things in the simulator all the time, every time. So um, another day or so later, I see this headline, uh, TransAsia grounds pilots who failed the proficiency test that we just talked about in the wake of the plane crash. Uh, the uh, So the as we mentioned, the Civil Aeronautics Administration ordered the airline's pilots to undergo retraining and tests. Of TransAsia's 68 pilots, 10 failed the first part of the qualification test, according to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the head of the Civil Air, uh, Aeronautics Administration reportedly said that the 10 pilots, as well as 19 others who have not yet taken the oral proficiency test, will be grounded until they pass. TransAsia's other pilots who pass the test are allowed to fly but will have to participate in future simulation training. So again, the crash that killed 42 people is still under investigation, but data from the plane's recorders show that fuel was manually cut off from the left engine after the right engine flamed out. So it's possible, though not proven, that the pilot cut off fuel from the wrong engine. Um, so whether or not training is an issue in this crash, the incident has put pressure on Asian countries to add additional regulations and oversight of airlines. Also, a little bit later in this article, TransAsia uh, requires a minimum of just 300 flight hours for new pilots. But in the wake of the crash, the carrier said it is considering increasing that number. In comparison, China Airlines requires 5,000 hours, according to the Wall Street Journal, while the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration requires pilots hired by American carriers to have at least 1,500. Now, we know that that's not exactly right. There are some restricted ATP uh, um, options. Uh, if you go to a accredited school for a two- or four-year school, that could be reduced the number of hours required for an ATP. Also, if, you, if you've come out of the military, that amount is basically cut in half, 750 hours as opposed to the 1,500. But um, so we have that. And uh, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Um, an AirAsia Airbus 330-300 uh, ended up um, having a problem with their auto thrust system and uh, they ended up uh, diverting or returning to uh, Kuala Lumpur, I think. Yes, they turned around. Let's see, let me read this here. An AirAsia uh, Airbus A330 was performing flight 172 from Kuala, Kuala, <laughs> Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia to Jeddah, or Jeddah? in Saudi Arabia with 371 people on board. It had just reached cruise level 300, so about, about 30,000 feet, about 110 nautical miles east-northeast of Kuala Lumpur, when the crew entered a holding pattern to work the checklist on the failure of an auto throttle, and subsequently decided to return to Kuala Lumpur. The aircraft burned off fuel and landed safely back at about four hours and 45 minutes past the original departure. And uh, I'm thinking, pff, why? Why would you have to return for an auto thrust failure? Just operate the throttles manually. Well, maybe they have some restrictions in their, at their airline for continuing flight. Maybe they're not allowed to Maybe they didn't have confidence in their own skills to fly the airplane without auto thrust systems. I don't know. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, and I talked about on the last episode, the skill levels and training and uh, regulation of aviation in that area of the world and some of the problems that uh, they're facing. 
And it just seems that maybe it's just a coincidence, but lately, I mean, all the big accidents that we're hearing about or incidents that we're hearing about are from this part of the world. And speaking of this part of the world, um, this article uh, from John Croft in Aviation Week, uh, so, uh, Air, uh, excuse me, Asia Pacific offers much opportunity for expatriate pilots. Supply and demand in Asia translates to premium pay and opportunities for expatriate pilots. An Airbus A319 or 320 captain willing to move to China for Beijing, Beijing Capital Airlines right now can earn a starting pay of $290,000 a year including various allowances, safety, and retention bonuses. That same pilot could commute to work at Beijing Capital one month on and one month off and make just under $200,000 a year. For the subset of pilots willing and able to work in the Far East, the money and rapid job advancement are there for the taking and will be there for the next five years or more, according to Michael Johnson, president and CEO of Paramount, Paramount Aviation Resources Group, a flight crew procure, procure, <laughs> procurement company based in Virginia. Pilots at U.S. majors, where seniority dominates, can make similar salaries over time, but typically have to fly as a first officer for more than 15 years before moving to the left seat, says Johnson. By contrast, at Vietnam's Viet Jet Air, expat A320 first officers today can transition to captains in as little as one to two years. They can upgrade at a much faster rate on the same equipment than they presently can in the U.S. Paramount is placing pilots with 10 strong customers in a variety of Asia-Pacific countries, including China, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and India, uh, they have access to capital but have a difficult time getting pilots from within their countries. So they rely very heavily on expat pilots to fly their aircraft. With this kind of demand, it's very hard for agencies th throughout the world to place pilots fast enough to keep, he says. There's absolutely no ceiling to the number of pilots we can submit to our customers in Asia. They just keep calling us saying, send more pilots, send more pilots. Nowhere is that need stronger than in China. Johnson notes that 42% of commercial aircraft deliveries in 2014 went to the Asia-Pacific region. China took 45% of those, representing about 25% of the total deliveries um, last year. Introduction of new aircraft means demand for new crews. So, uh, and they go on to state the uh, some of the stats that Boeing has projected for estimating over the next 20 years requiring at least in that region, 216,000 pilots, in addition to uh, maintainers and uh, other people in uh, supporting aviation there as well. Oh, let's see. Johnson says there are thousands of expat pilots flying in the region with most of the new recruits coming from Europe, South America, Australia, and New Zealand. In some cases, pilots move when carriers go out of business, but in other cases, they go because the terms are so fav favorable, says Johnson. He says about 5 to 10 percent of the pilots' paramount places come from the U.S., where domestic opportunities are on the rise with major airlines hiring in large numbers. The U.S. pilots who do take the jobs generally come from regional airlines or defunct carriers, such as ATA and USA 3000 in recent years. He says the company does not place many former military pilots. They don't assimilate easily, he says. Hmm. I wonder why he says that. Okay. The expat pilot demand could be a relatively short-term phenomenon. Johnson says countries are training indigenous first officers in flight schools around the world, including the U.S., and putting them in the right seat to gain experience with the expat pilots who provide mentoring. Eventually, those first officers will transition to captain, reducing the necessity for foreign pilots. In the next five to ten years, however, the demand for expats can only increase. It's not feasible for airlines to fill all those seats, he says. Uh, contracts are typically for three to five years, although most are renewable with mandatory retirement, retirement at 60 years of age for pilots working in China. So, uh, anyway, if you're interested in... Uh, 
you know, getting a job over in the Asian Pacific region. Uh, you should check out companies such as uh, Mr. Uh, I've already forgotten his name, Michael Johnson, President and CEO of uh, his company, Paramount Aviation Resources Group. So we have that. Speaking of hiring and the need for pilots, again, John Croft, uh, Aviation Week, uh, wrote another article, U.S. Carriers Face Shrinking Pool of Pilots. Uh, a bubble of impending pilot retirements among major carriers over the next seven years is forcing the entire pilot supply chain to unify in a search for solutions to keep the industry due to to keep the industry from stalling from open cockpit seats. There is still a debate about the magnitude of the problem, but its incipient effects are already showing in the form of canceled flights, parked regional aircraft, and a 10% cut in service to 86 communities, according to Roger Cohen, president of the Regional Airline Association. Uh, Cohen says that in the past, pilot shortages were like Bigfoot sightings. Everyone had heard about them, but no one had seen any. There's almost a universal acknowledgement now that there is a shortage. So they go on to uh, talk about some other folks that are saying the same thing and talking about um, some of the programs that some of the airlines, such as Delta, are, are trying to initiate to keep that pool filled with uh, qualified applicants. Uh, there was a program uh, that Delta started last summer uh, with... Um, Let's see what airline on no not envoy but Endeavor but apparently that program didn't work out due to some problems with the union I believe at Endeavor uh, that uh, didn't like what was happening with the um, with the pilots and their pipeline and uh, that they kind of squashed the whole thing. Uh, some more details there I'm sure I'm leaving out. Um, also uh, there in the article they talk about the uh, program uh, that Cape Air has a uh, gateway program with JetBlue airline or airways it's now in its eighth year uh, so to date 17 Cape Air captains have transitioned through the program to become first officers with JetBlue so if you want to read more about uh, some of the uh, some of the efforts by uh, some of the airlines to try to you know keep this shortage from occurring or at least from impacting the particular carrier, uh, check out this article. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. And I also stapled on this <laughs> also from Aviation Week, an opinion piece by uh, Ashley Nunes or Nunes, I'm not sure how, do you, how to pronounce his last name. And um, again, this is one of these opinion pieces. He talks about the workforce shortage in aviation. Um, let's see. And and I, I just wanted to touch on this a little bit because I don't really agree uh, or I don't like what the, um, the writer of this, the author, is kind of um, inferring by what he has written here. Uh, let me read just one example of something that I don't agree with. Current workforce shortage, shortages stem from a universal demographic phenomenon known as global aging, the product of people having fewer children while living longer. It means that as older workers retire, an insufficient number of younger workers are available to replace them. Uh, so he goes on stating some stats about, uh, you know, people entering the workforce are just not as high as, uh, not high, that's not the right way to phrase that. Well, let, let me write or read what he said. According to a Boston Consulting Group report, 2010 saw 0.3 people retiring for each person entering the workforce. However, by 2050, that number will rise to 0.7 people retiring for people entering the workforce. With a global economic footprint of some 2.4 trillion, the consequences of workforce shortages in the aviation industry are especially problematic. So... Right there he's saying, well, one of the reasons, and I guess you could say maybe part of the reason that we're having trouble or a shortage of qualified people is because of this, this whole phenomenon of global aging. But 
I don't think so. I think it's because we haven't been encouraging people to fly for a living. And um, if you look at how uh, what a great job it was, 20, 30, and I'm, I'm not saying it's not a great job now, but if you go back 20, 30, 40 years and uh, look at how pilots were compensated and uh, what their work rules were then and how many days a month they worked, etc. And then you compare it to today. You'll see that uh, things have really significantly changed over that time. And um, a lot of people, you know, especially with all the topsy-turvy turmoil in the industry over the last 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of people go, oh, it's not worth it. I'm not going to, you know, invest a lot of my time and a huge amount of money uh, into a, a career that may or may not work out. I mean, we all know people who have been retired at least, uh, not retired, furloughed at least once or twice. And um, they, many of those people said, forget it. I'm just going to go to a, a career that uh, is more stable and uh, I can, so I can provide for my family, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that the problem has been that the, uh, the this job just doesn't, have the allure it used to have. Although there are still people like me, and I know a lot of people like me who love to fly, and uh, and would do this job, you know, if it compensated us really, really well or not. But there, but there, that's a small subset of the people out here doing the job. And um, if somebody is r really not in love with flying and doesn't really have a very strong passion to do it. And then they're faced with all this debt that they're going to have to incur to be qualified to get hired by one of the airlines, and uh, put their family through, you know, a lot of time away from them, etc. You know, the living on the road is, you know, I try to make the most of it, but it's not the best thing in the world for family life and relationships and such. So, you know, that's something that we sacrifice to do this job. Yeah, it's a cool job, but we sacrifice a lot and. Uh, Sometimes I think we take that for granted, but again, um, you know, it's just, it hasn't been a, I know I'm going all over the place here, but it, it just hasn't been one of those jobs that has been keeping pace with, uh, you know, the, the economy and, and, uh, the cost of living and everything else over the years. And, uh, a lot of people have said, forget it. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. It'd be fun to fly an airplane for a living, but it's just not worth it. You know, I, I'd rather go out and get a master's degree or a doctorate or whatever and go out and work in this industry and make really good money and, you know, and fly on the side, you know, fly for a, for recreation, for a hobby, as many of you listening do. So, you know, we, we just have not um, provided an incentive for young people to want to get into this this industry. So I don't think it's really the, the global aging aspect of it but uh, so in this um, opinion piece he said uh, he talks about various approaches that have been taken thus far to address the issue the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore is focusing on cultivating youth interest in the aviation industry industry through a series of outreach programs uh, they also talk about a complementary approach addressing the geographic inaccessibility of education has been taken on by Utah Valley University Potential recruits can now access formal training courses in aviation management, flight training, and more anywhere internet access is available. Of course, I don't know how you're going to learn how to fly an airplane uh, through the internet, but uh, I'll move on here. Um, airlines have also started started offering more generous fiscal incentives hey, that encourage recruitment and retention. And then he points out to what I, I talked about on uh, an earlier news item, Chinese carriers are reported to be luring American pilots with financial packages in excess of $270,000, a sum roughly double what those pilots might receive back home. Um, and then he continues, hence the question the aviation industry must address is not how can workforce size be increased, rather how can growing demand be met using fewer workers? Okay, so here we go. One answer is technology. For example, 
Systems like satellite-based communications enable aircraft to report their geographic position more accurately. More accurate position reports opens up the possibility of fewer air traffic controllers handling larger volumes of aircraft because these aircraft can now fly closer together without safety being affected. And I put here a bunch of question marks, huh? I'm not sure I follow his reasoning there. Uh, technological advances can also help airlines cope with pilot shortages by delegating tasks historically performed by humans to onboard automation. Okay, so here's one of these guys that thinks that we can get rid of one or all pilots in the cockpit and uh, just take care of it with the automation. Eh, wrong. It's not going to work, people. I'm telling you. Um, and so here's his reasoning. This is evident in cockpits today where navigator and flight engineer positions have been eliminated due, to, due in part to improvements in instrument design and engine re reliability. And then I put a little note in here. Deductive reasoning does not work in this case. Just because we got rid of the flight engineer and the navigator doesn't mean we can get rid of both pilots or one of the two remaining pilots. It's just that, that reasoning, using deductive reasoning, doesn't work in this case. Okay? That's all I'll say. Um, and then, of course, yeah, but uh, the problem's going to be, uh, this is uh, what he continues with, efforts using technology to ease the pressure placed on human capital have historically faced opposition from labor unions who view automation as a threat to job security, the old buggy whip manufacturer kind of argument. And uh, so I say, you know, this... Um, this opinion piece, I'm sorry, I'm sure you're a very nice guy. Uh, just uh, it doesn't cut it. it. It's This is not the way we're going to solve the shortage of pilots by eliminating pilot positions. In the meantime, you know, sacrificing safety. It's just, it, it ain't going to happen. Sorry, that's my opinion. That's my opinion piece. All right, moving on. I didn't want to spend that much time on that article, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, this happened just a few days ago. I think it was either Monday or Tuesday at Houston Intercontinental Airport in Houston, Texas. A U.S. Airways Embraer ERJ-190 uh, performing flight, uh, U.S. Air Flight 1825 from Philadelphia to Houston with 53 passengers and four crew was on approach to Houston's runway 27 when Upon being handed off to tower, the crew requested to maintain 2,000 feet to troubleshoot this. Uh, the approach clearance was canceled, and the aircraft overflew the runway. Hey, I have some audio here, so let's listen to the events that night. Hold on, safe gear indication behind you on final. Right. Tower wind 3505, runway 27, cleared low approach. All right, clear for the low approach on 27, and what altitude would you like us at, Texas uh, 1825? Texas 1825 for the low approach, your discretion. After completion of low approach, fly runway heading, maintain 2,000. All right, runway heading up to 2,000, and uh, our discretion, Texas 1825. We're going out of 1,400 for it. Would you like the uh, lights on or off, sir? Is it better for you to see? Texas 1825, I believe lights on would be better for us. All right, we got a ball on for you. Yeah, 1825, we're turning up the uh, runway light intensity. Additionally, you want us looking at your nose or uh, the mains? Yeah, concentrate on the nose. We got good nose and then everything went red. Or we got good mains, but we got ever, uh, had a red nose and now everything's red. So we got something down because we're dragging. Like this 1825, we're unable to visualize your nose gear at this time. When you're able, turn right heading 360, maintain 2000. Alright, right turn 360, maintain 2000. Do you think another pass a little lower would help, or do you uh, think you're not just not going to be able to see it at all? Check 1825, definitely lower would be a better approach. Okay, we we're at 1300 MSL there. What, what would you recommend? You want us to get out of five? Check 1825, affirmative. Alright, we'll come back around and try that one more time, see if that helps. Because I don't have to determine what checklist I do here, if they're down or not. Cactus 1825, climb and maintain 3,000, stay altitude. I climb up to 3,000 now, Cactus 1825. Cactus 1825, stay altitude. We're at about 1,800 now for three. Cactus 1825, 
contact approach on 119.62. 1962, practice 1825. Approximately 500 feet MSL. If you could uh, get near the approach end or, or middle of the runway to uh, visualize their nose gear. They said they had uh, the mains appeared to be fine, but they've got reds for the nose gear. So mainly we're looking at the nose gear on the E-190. United 1274, Houston Tower, 1350 at 4, runway 27, clear to land. Clear to land, 27, clear to walk at the end. United 1274, plan a high-speed turnoff. I have an aircraft with an unscathed nose gear indication that's going to do a low approach behind you. Okay, United 1274, on high-speed. Ops 31, the next aircraft to land is a Boeing 737 from United Airlines. The Cactus C-190 will follow that aircraft. At the completion of approach, by the way, heading maintain 2,000. We have air, uh, different vehicles staged on the uh, parallel taxiways to also look at your gear. All right, thank you, sir. Cloud maintain 2,000. I'm sorry, what was the website again? Texas 1825. At the completion of this approach, by the heading maintain 2,000. Thank you. Texas 1825. The uh, airport vehicle said it does not appear that there's a nose wheel for your aircraft down. I observed uh, the same thing, did not appear that you had a nose wheel down and in place. Okay, sir, we're going to declare an emergency at this time. We have 56 souls on board, 4,600 pounds of gas. We'll probably be landing with just about 3,000 when we touch down. Dactus 1825, copy all. Climb and maintain 3,000, turn right heading 360. 3,360, we're going to have to make a plan here, run some checklists, we'll get back to you, give us some time. Cactus 1825, if you need an air uh, runway other than runway 27, just advise. Okay, well, either you or the emergency crew uh, uh, recommends for us tonight. Cactus 1825, we're already deployed to runway 27, let's plan on a runway 27 arrival. Okay, sir, sounds good. I have the company on the uh, horn there, I'm going to be talking to them for a few minutes. Cactus 1825, affirmative. Contact approach on 119.62 again, and uh, they'll be aware that you are in an emergency as well. Thanks, man. Uh, plan on uh, approaching 27 over to 1962, and we'll uh, talk to you in a little bit. Thanks, Kansas. 1825. Bush Command, Houston Tower. Bush Command, go ahead. Bush Command, the uh, E-190 is still well north of the field. They're running the checklist. We'll give you a 20-mile final call for runway 27 for them. Bush Command received understand at 20 miles north, so just give us a heads up when they're coming in. Affirmative for Bush Command. Attention all vehicles on the sound complex. The emergency aircraft is still circling in the airspace um, at least eight minutes out. Yeah. Bush Command, Houston Tech. Bush Command, go ahead. Bush Command, the uh, emergency aircraft is now two eight miles northeast of the airport inbound about uh, eight minutes out of current speed, likely to be nine or ten by the time he gets here. Bush Command, Houston Tech. Bush Command, go ahead. And Bush Command, the aircraft is planning an evacuation on the runway once they touch down. I understand uh, planning on evacuation on the runway before or after touchdown and rollout. Uh, is there any way I can have a quick conversation with the PIC? 25, we're uh, track Festa to join up with the uh, ILS uh, Q7. Cactus 1825, Houston Tower, wind 0103, runway 27, cleared for the option. All right, sir. Uh, runway 27, cleared for the option. Cactus 1825. Cactus 1825, emergency vehicles are standing by. They have your request. They would like to speak to you. The call sign of the uh, lead is Bush Command. Bush Command will now uh, speak directly to you. Okay, Cactus 1825. Texas 1825, this is Bush Command. I just wanted to get a heads up uh, with your attempts to uh, recycle it here and get success. We have not had success. Uh, we do believe our nose landing gear is uh, still retracted. Our two main landing gears appear to be down, and the nose wheel appears to be up. I understand nose gear, no joy. The nose appear to be up. The uh, I understand also your plan is to evacuate upon the aircraft stopping on the runway. We concur with that. I uh, just want to advise you that we're going to have some equipment that's going to be approaching the nose here in case you have any sparking to go up there and do a quick little knockdown. And we've got people that will be available on the ground to assist with your evacuation. 
No Bush Command, the arrival will be our Christian. The emergency will be the next arrival approximately five minutes in. Access is Bush Command. Everything looks good so far. We're evacuating. You can address the nose. You can continue your evacuation. We are evacuating. We're evacuating on the runways. Sir, copy. Okay. <laughs> A little bit of miscommunication at the end. I think the uh, bush control, the, uh, the the ground people, uh, the f crash fire rescue people, uh, were approaching the airplane and saying that everything was looking good. And they just, after I guess they came to a stop, they uh, commanded the evacuation. A little bit of excitement at the very end. But uh, job well done by the uh, crew of U.S. Airways Flight 1825. And uh, there were no injuries uh, reported at all, even after the evacuation. And uh, also, I give uh, kudos to the uh, great work by the uh, folks at the uh, Houston Intercontinental Airport, uh, especially the crash rescue fire folks, um, you know, getting on and, and communicating. Remember, communication is so important uh, with what the plan was and uh, the, uh, the, the fire chief or whatever his job uh, title is. You know, basically saying this is what we're going to do, and we're there to help you assist in uh, the evacuation, etc. So, a very happy ending to the uh, Embraer 190, which landed nose gear up, and uh, that's that for that. And uh, let's see. Finally, in the news section, it's kind of a long first section today of today's podcast. Oh well. Um, read this um i think this was from yeah i get a little email um every couple of days from aviation week and uh, you can sign up for that as well at aviationweek.com um, and the title of this article is high altitude ice crystal icing can cause engine failure and this is by patrick r uh, violette uh, this type of icing does not appear on radar due to its low reflectivity. Neither airplane ice detectors nor visual indications reliably indicate the presence of ice crystal icing conditions. It's often undetected by the flight crew and has caused many high altitude engine failures. By the way, I'm not reading the entire article. I'm only taking uh, some, some excerpts from it. I'll have the link to the full article if you're interested in reading more about this um, in the show notes. Um, he goes on to say, many business jets have the capability to climb quickly into the mid-40 flight levels and cruise far above most weather. It can be tempting to sit back, enjoying the generally clear skies at these altitudes and taking relief that the weather below us can't hurt us. Unfortunately, that comfort zone was tempor temporarily burst on November 28, 2005, when the dual-engine flameout of a beach jet rudely awakened the business jet community. Answers to important questions were not readily available in the immediate aftermath. Many of us wondered what could have caused two engines to simultaneously fail. Were these failures limited to the Pratt & Whitney Canada JT-15D design, or could this happen to other engines? And the answer is yes, it can and has. Um, and I was thinking, I don't remember this particular incident, the uh, beach jet um, flaming out two engines. And so I did a little bit of research and found this on, uh, let's see, the Flight Safety Foundation Aero Safety World. Uh, again, I'll have a link to this in the show notes. Uh, the beach jet was on a fractional ownership operation positioning flight from Indianapolis to Marco Island, Florida. Uh, the afternoon of November 28, 2005, the aircraft, the airplane had been flown at flight level 400 for 30 minutes, flight level 380 for 15 minutes when the flight crew received clearance from air traffic control for further descent to flight level 330. The flight was operating in visual meteorological conditions in the vicinity of cumulonimbus buildups, said the final report on the incident. The first officer, who had 3,100 flight hours, including about 20 hours in type, was flying the beach jet from the left seat. When he pulled back the throttles to begin the descent, the pilots heard loud pops and saw that both engines had flamed out. They donned their oxygen masks, declared an emergency, established a glide speed of 180 knots, and diverted the flight to, a, to nearby Jacksonville International Airport. The captain, 
a Czech airman with 8,200 flight hours, including 1,800 hours in type, attempted unsuccessfully to restart the engines using battery power. Descending through flight level 260, the crew increased airspeed to 230 knots to attempt a windmill start, but there was no indication of engine rotation. During the descent, ATC provided vectors to the ILS uh, instrument landing system approach to runway 7 at Jacksonville. The flight was in clouds during the descent, with moderate to heavy rain beginning at about 10,000 feet. As the airplane neared the airport, ATC provided continuous callouts of the distance remaining to the runway that the pilots later stated was very helpful in managing their descent and approach to the airport. The captain assumed control at about 9,000 feet. The landing gear was extended manually, and the beach jet broke out of the clouds at about 1,200 feet. After they landed and rolled off the runway onto a taxiway, the right landing gear tire deflated. Investigators determined that ice crystals had caused the flameouts. Quote, research revealed that convective storms can lift significant amounts of water into the upper atmosphere and that the blow-off from the tops of these storms can contain significant amounts of ice crystals. A post-incident study showed that the ice crystals could partially melt passing through the low-pressure compressor of the JT-15D5 engines due to the increase in temperature of the air being compressed. Further, the study determined that with the engine anti-ice turned off, it was possible for the ice crystals to accrete on the leading edges of the front inner compressor stator leading edges. If a significant buildup of ice had occurred, any change in the airflow angle of incidence uh, that would occur as power is reduced would cause any ice that had accreted on the leading edges of the stators to break away and would result in the engine surging and possibly flame flaming out. And they also go into a little bit more detail about how that some of this ice can actually get into a part of the engine which would actually prevent the engine from rotating and restarting, as was the case in this incident. Um, so, yeah, good job to uh, the pilots on that flight, uh, basically dead sticking that landing all the way to the runway in Jacksonville. I wonder if the person at the controls in this incident was had some glider training. It would be interesting to know. Anyway, so going, getting back to the uh, article from Aviation Week, um, uh, they talk about a study by NASA scientists Harold Addy, Jr., and Joseph uh, Verez of the Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, and uh, they did a paper and study, an overview of NASA engine ice crystal icing research. And they put that out in November of 2011. And they say that this is a problem whose frequency, frequency is alarmingly high. Evidence indicates that engine icing incidents caused by ice accreting inside the core of jet-based engines have been occurring for over two decades. So they're talking about some of the research that uh, is going into this uh, to try to solve it. Um, let me just read a couple more little bits of this article, and again, I'll have the link to the whole thing in the show notes. One of the perplexing issues that confronted investigators during interviews with incident pilots was that the conditions at the time of the engine loss were routine and not perceived as a threat due to the lack of airframe icing and only moderate turbulence. Um, the uh, NASA's Addy and Verez believe it may well be that the difference between conditions that are hazardous and those that are not is not discernible to the pilot. Uh, the incidents further stymied investigators because they occurred outside of flight conditions that are currently defined by regulatory authorities as, quote, icing conditions. So, uh, again, moving on a little bit further into the article um, let's see. Well, the clues to solving the beach jet mystery began with propulsion engineers who had worked a similarly mysterious problem in high bypass ratio turbine fan engine powerless events in regional aircraft during the mid 1990s. The engines experienced uncommanded thrust reductions when cruising in the vicinity of major thunderstorms at altitudes between 28 and 31,000 feet. All incidents occurred in IMC in cloud at thrust levels between 90 and 100% maximum continuous thrust with precipitation reported. 
The uncommanded thrust reduction manifested itself initially by a gradual decay in fan speed, an increase in turbine gas temperature, and a failure of the engine to respond to pilot commanded thrust changes. Thankfully, in these events, as the aircraft descended to a lower altitude, usually around 10,000 feet, the ice blockage released, making the engine recovery process possible. Uh, the two researchers, Addy and Verez, or Vries, point out that the complex aerothermodam ther <laughs> aerothermodynamics involved that permit ice to accrete inside the core of an engine in flight are not understood to a level that allows effective analysis and prevention or mitigation techniques to be employed in a robust manner. These scientists talk in such really strange ways. Thus, it took immense engineering and investigatory research to discover it was possible for ice to accumulate on the second stage stator inside the engine core passage without the presence of significant supercooled liquid water in the air. All right, so let's cut to the chase, okay? Um, generally, these events occur between ISA plus 10 degrees Celsius and plus 20. Uh, in fact, most of the events occurred outside the FAR Part 25 Appendix C envelope for engine certification in icing conditions. Aircraft were in the vicinity of convective clouds and thunderstorms, although flight crews reported no flight radar echoes at the altitude of the event. Precipitation in the form of rain was noted on the windscreen, which at first perplexed investigators because the events occurred at altitudes far higher than where supercooled raindrops would exist. No airframe icing was noted. It has been determined that the rain on the windscreen was actually the melting of the high altitude ice particles. Um, so uh, let's see, these ice particles are roughly 40 microns in diameter and even in high concentrations they're not visually detectable even in daytime conditions. Um, can radar be used to detect these zones? Unfortunately not for several reasons dealing with the limitations inherent with radar and returns. Uh, let's see, hazardous events will, such as these, will continue to occur unless more robust means to address the problem are developed. There is a small group of engine and airframe manufacturers uh, that have formed a consortium called the Ice Crystal Consortium to pool resources to address the problem. And um, Let's see, until they come up with a way to prevent this from happening uh, and until all engines are redesigned and recertified for this yet to be fully defined problem, it is necessary for pilots to follow interim operational guidance. The tools available to a, the pilot of a commercial jet to identify regions of potentially high ice particle concentration are limited. Onboard weather radar does not show significant returns for these events at altitude. It is prudent to assume that flight in the close vicinity of a thunderstorm may lead to high IWC encounters that can lead to engine events. However, it's also clear from the event database that this model is not sufficient as a general avoidance strategy. Uh, incidents have occurred in regions of multiple convective cells with merged anvil regions where there was no high re reflectivity core at flight altitude. So in other words, what they're saying is you can't really use the radar to detect these very, very small ice crystals. It's just not enough there to reflect the radar energy back to the radar antenna. So it's like you, you know, you're flying along uh, these big giant thunderstorms, especially in the tropical areas of the world, um, and uh, you, you don't see any icing, you don't see any returns on your radar, and uh, maybe you're flying downstream or downwind of the anvil, and then all of a sudden you're in the right conditions for um, engine, whatever we're calling this, high altitude ice accretion. So um, they talk about you know flying upwind of these cells, which is always a good idea as far as avoiding turbulence. But um, if you're flying transport aircraft or business aircraft, and you fly in regions of the world where you encounter these kind of conditions, even if you're in VMC and you're not really showing anything hazardous looking on your radar, be uh, advised that you could be flying in an area with these uh, very tiny ice crystals and it could end up flaming out your engine. So if you suspect that you could be in these areas, that you should be flying with your engine and ice systems on uh, just to you know, try to prevent something like this from happening. 
Um, this article goes on to say that um, um, the FAA has issued an immediate adoption of an airworthiness directed on, directive on Boeing 747-800 and 787-800 aircraft without the normal notice and comment period um, prior to adoption due to recent engine power losses from ice crystal icing. And we've talked about some of these events on earlier shows. Investigation officials are currently exploring whether it played a role in the fatal crash in northern Mali of a Boeing MD-83 operated for Air Algerie, uh, Algerie by Spanish operator Swift Air while en route from uh, Burkina Faso to Algiers on July 24th of last year. The ice crystal icing problem must be addressed in training. A ground school training needs to explain the factors involved, the warning signs and the conditions to avoid. And uh, this is a techni technically complex topic and quite frankly uh, this author, the person writing this article, uh, his experience listening to a, a well-meaning but not technically savvy ground instructor. Um, well anyway, he's saying that uh, there, there should be a a really, really effective way to try to explain this phenomenon and what to do to avoid it uh, to people like me who fly these things for a living. Um, so anyway, if you want to read more or the entire article here, again, link in the show notes. Oh, wow. Much longer than I expected to spend on news this episode, but there you have it. So now it is time for... Okay, I don't want to startle anybody. If anybody's going to sleep, wake up. Captain, incoming message. Sorry, Bruce. I know, I know. I said we were going to leave that alone, but uh, couldn't. I just couldn't help it. Okay, the first piece of feedback from Rob. Uh, he sent me a link. He said, I thought I'd forward you this article I just read. And it's from bbc.co.uk. It details a change in the way approaching air traffic will be spaced at Heathrow. Instead of distance-based spacing, they'll be implementing a time-based system. Apparently, they've done extensive testing and have been approved by the CAA. He says, I'm not quite sure what I make of this. Of course, it is targeted at reducing the number of delays. However, anytime I hear planes, very big planes, are flying closer together, I get a little skeptical. When I'm flying, the further the aircraft are from me, the better. It seems This seems to be a pilot initiative, but I wouldn't be surprised if it, it, if it has been implemented elsewhere. Indeed, uh, the uh, NATS, the UK Air Traffic Controllers Organization, plan to champion this worldwide if it's successful at Heathrow. And he said, I would be interested to hear your views and those of the community. And uh, so he goes on uh, to say that he is laid up with a knee injury at the moment and have been dousing myself in all things aviation in order to keep a firm grasp on my sanity. I love the last few shows. How somebody could fall asleep to them, I don't know. But hey, I guess it's got to be those dulcet tones, eh, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> uh, speak to you again sometime. Take care, Captain Jeff Rob. Okay. Thank you, Rob. And uh, so here is the article in BBC, or at bbc.co.uk. Um, a new way to stop the gridlock in the skies. The principle is simple enough. Planes coming into land will be spaced out by time rather than by distance. But it has taken, taken a team at NATS, formerly National Air Traffic Control Services, four years of study scientific study to make sure it is safe and Heathrow is about to become the first airport on the planet to test it out. And it all comes down to wind. Wind is the biggest single cause of landing delays at London's Heathrow Airport, messing up flights on around 65 days each year. If airliners are fighting against a headwind, even if they maintain the same speed through the air, they take longer to reach the runway and that creates delays. Okay, we, we know that airspeed doesn't necessarily translate to ground speed. So if you're flying in a headwind, obviously the speed through the air is faster than the speed over the ground. Uh, the new time-based separation, TBS, system 
simply moves the aircraft closer together, thus cutting those delays. On windy days, we lose around eight aircraft movements an hour. That is every hour throughout the day, says Paul Haskins from Nats. With time-based spacing, we should see a lot fewer delays and lower holding, and hopefully a far more resilient operation in strong wind conditions. At the moment, air traffic controllers give planes a speed limit as they approach the runway at Heathrow, 160 knots from 4 miles out. It gives pilots time to get set up for landing, put the wheels down, arrange the flaps, etc. That won't change. So if they're going at the same speed, surely they will take the same amount of time to reach the lip of the runway, regardless of the wind? No, it doesn't work like that. And so it goes on in this article to talk about what we already know and what I just kind of quickly, you know, summarized. Uh, let's see. The new system uh, all comes down to vortices or vortices. A vortex is a dangerous spiral of air churned up by an aircraft as it cuts through the sky. If you fly through one, pilots can temporarily lose control of the plane. That is why air traffic controllers leave big gaps between flights. And that's a good thing. With bigger aircraft like the behemoth Airbus A380, they leave a space of six or seven nautical miles to the next plane. With the relative tiddlers, like the Boeing 737, it's more likely to be three nautical miles. But Nats has worked out that strong headwinds smooth out these dangerous swirls of air much more quickly. So it's actually safe for the aircraft to fly closer together if it's windy. Wind changes all the time. It gusts. That's why sensors on the aircraft are constantly feeding the latest wind information to the ground to make sure the system is working everything out properly. To give an idea of the impact that that can have on a normal day at Heathrow, you get around 40 to 45 landings per hour. At the moment, if it's windy, that might reduce it to as little as 32. But with the new system, you get back that rate uh, of up to 40 landings per hour. And uh, so it goes on to say why you know Heathrow is a good place to do this, uh, because they're basically at the full capacity right now. And... Um, Let's see, how close is close? TBS will mean aircraft flying closer together on windy days, but how much closer? Let's say on a normal day in nor normal weather, an Airbus A380 is told to fly six nautical miles away from the next aircraft. It would take that airliner 135 seconds to cover that distance. Now, let's say there's a strong headwind. The Airbus would take an additional 25 seconds to cover that same distance. Under the new system, controllers will forget the distance gap and tell the aircraft to maintain the same time gap. 135 seconds. It puts the planes nearly one nautical mile closer together, but because of the wind, it should be perfectly safe. And they say safe. They say that they have uh, been doing four years of scientific testing using um, lasers. Uh, firing a laser into the air above Heathrow as thousands of aircraft have been coming into land. The equipment measures the size of the vortex and how long it took to lose its sting. Engineers checked 150,000 different flights, and that was enough to convince the regulator, the Civil Aviation Authority, to approve the new system. And they're going to start using this new system at Heathrow in March of this year. And uh, the only thing I, I'm not sure about on this article, and I think it's because uh, the person writing it maybe didn't quite understand, or perhaps they tried to simplify this too much for... Uh, a layperson, but uh, I don't think that uh, if somebody told me today to decrease the gap between myself and the airplane in front of me in, in uh, you know using time, I don't know how I'd do that. I mean, there's we don't have a device that says, okay, make the space in between you and the airplane ahead of you 135 seconds. Um, I think what would happen in this case using this kind of system is that the people in the control tower would have some means to adjust the speed of the aircraft, you know, telling us to increase or maintain a certain speed or allowing us a certain distance um, uh, under their control. I don't think that that's something that we're going to be able to control inside of our airplane. Uh, so that's my only little question mark about this whole thing, but uh, pretty, pretty interesting. You know, it's um, wind definitely does play a role in wake turbulence avoidance. Um, 
And uh, if this system works, then maybe we'll see it at more airports uh, around the world, including here in the States. Now, there are a few places here in the United States that have impl implemented new spacing criteria. Again, they're not using time, but they're using space. And uh, it's called the RECATS system. The, uh, or, no, let's see, the Wake Turbulence Recategorization Program or something like this. R-E-C-A-T-S, RECATS, I think is what they're calling it. Uh, they implemented it at first in Memphis and then Louisville and also now in place in Atlanta where the distance between airplanes have been decreased and uh, honestly so far I have not noticed I have not encountered wake turbulence uh, any more frequently than I have in the past so perhaps the new recat system is working um, but um, I can see that a system like this would even be perhaps more effective so we'll see thank you Rob for sending that Monier Madison Widobira uh, writes uh, via Facebook, Captain Jeff, I have a question for you. With what's going on in Iraq and Syria, have you throughout your career felt uncomfortable flying to any destination due to security, health, or political concerns? Probably not during your time with ACME, but I'm assuming that you were in the Air Force. You, while you were in the Air Force, you had to fly to some interesting locations. Yes, I, I, I did. <laughs> Also, do airliners provide any guidelines in terms of what to do and not to do when flying to such a destination? Thank you, and keep on flying. Well, thank you. Um, well, yeah, in the Air Force, um, I, have, I flew in a, a, a couple different uh, places around the world that uh, uh, were not, you know, I would say completely risk-free. Um, and uh, but that's you know the that's the nature of the beast. If you're in the armed military services for your country uh, even if you're flying an airplane like I was the uh, C141 Starlifter there are times when you're going to be encountering situations where it's not 100% safe or 100% risk free um I'm not going to go into detail because the show is going to be too long but yeah I I've, I've been into some situations but again you know I'm I'm a member of the US Air Force and uh, I understand that I'm basically uh putting my life out there for the defense of my country and uh, so you know you don't you don't think about it too much um, but um, it's there it's just accepted you know that you could be placed in a situation that's not completely safe um, now regarding the airline world you know one of the reasons why I like flying domestically here in the United States is that I don't really have to worry about some of the politically charged areas of the world or some of the air areas of the world where uh, there uh, are mosquito-borne uh, diseases and that kind of thing. I don't know why I said diseases. I think it was because I had a little bit of a... I didn't eat lunch, and I'm really looking forward to meeting up with uh, Jeff again to, uh, to get something to eat here in just under an hour. In fact, in about um, 30 minutes, so i got to hurry up here. Um, so my, my system is finally starting to balk at the fact that I've only had something to eat for breakfast. Anyway, I digress in a big way. Uh, airlines, uh, guidelines uh, to um, areas in the world where there might be health or political concerns. Yes, we do have guidelines. It's all available in our database. We have um, web pages that we can go to within our internal ACME uh, airlines uh, operations database where we can uh, learn information about certain regions of the world and precautions to take etc so yes ACME does a very good job of making sure that we're aware of what's happening in the places that we're flying and you know what what to do to keep yourself out of trouble so great question Monier or Monier um, moving on, Jay writes, loving the show and the new design of uh, AirlinePilotGuy.com. I'm only up to episode 134, so my feedback is pretty old. Number one, I am a former submarine officer, so we also operate in three dimensions. Hearing your take on the TBM hypoxia story and that a pilot with a problem should immediately descend without regard to other traffic letting ATC sort it out, reminds me, 
or it reminds of our theory in submarines if we have a casualty and have to emergency blow to the surface. We use the, quote, big ocean little boat theory. And while we'd love to know if we're going to hit someone up there, if it's life or death, we'll risk it. My guess is the skies are more crowded than the oceans, but I expect the big sky little plane rule still applies here. I agree. It usually does. Again, I'm not advocating making an uh, emergency descent, rapid descent, without any reason to, but if you're experiencing a situation where you suspect uh, you are losing your pressurization or you are about to lose your consciousness, you should descend very quickly. And, of course, the first thing to do is get that oxygen mask on and start sucking that so that you do not lose consciousness as a pilot. Number two, you alluded to this in an episode, but since Acme is retiring its 747 fleet and replacing with A350s, will those displaced 747 guys get first crack at the A350? No. How does that impact their seniority and can, can others sneak in? Or does the A350 share a type rating with the A330? I'm not sure about that. I know that um, we have talked about a big order for a, both Airbus 330s, uh, the 900 series, I believe, the bigger ones, longer range ones, and the Airbus 350. And uh, I did read an article that uh, Airbus was trying to certify it so that it was a common type rating. I think it depends on the individual airline as well, and it may have something to do with the regulatory agency that certifies that airplane in the country that you fly. Uh, but uh, I would imagine that if that's available, Acme will probably go for a common type rating because that will help with uh, training and other resources. Um, but as far as the 747 guys getting first crack at the A350, no. The whole thing's based on seniority. So when uh, an, a fleet is downsized, uh, we are given plenty of notice and uh, our company puts out information to us and says that, hey, we have just put out an advanced um, entitlement slash displacement notice, and it shows you the airplanes where there are either vacancies or surpluses. And uh, so when they're eliminating a fleet or, or a few airplanes in a fleet over time, they'll say, we have a surplus of 50 captains and 50 first officers on the 747 at this base. So if you, you, know, you should know what your seniority is at that, on that airplane at that base, and you should think, hmm, that means that I'm going to be one of those pilots displaced, as I was when I was flying as a captain on the 727. I knew that Acme was going to be retiring the 727 fleet eventually, and that I also knew that I was probably only going to be able to fly captain on it for a year and a half to two years, and that turned out to be correct. Um, and so when they announced that there were this many surplus captain positions in Atlanta, and I knew that I was going to be affected by that, I put my bid in, my displacement bid, in for the airplane that I wanted to be bumped down to. And in this case, I was bumped down to the airplane that I am flying currently, uh, which I didn't think I was going to be flying for very long, but here I am. I've not flown any other airplane longer than the airplane that I fly now, the Mad Dog, the MD-88, and also MD-8890. And uh, that was back in 2002, you know, right after September 11, 2001. Everything was really significantly affected by that. Um, and uh, anyway, um, I got bumped off. And if, if my seniority was good enough to fly captain on the Mad Dog in Atlanta, I would be awarded it. And that's what happened. So it didn't really have anything to do with the airplane that I was being displaced from. Uh, it had everything to do with what my seniority was at that point. So the, the, the pilots, both captains and first officers, on the 747s that are, you know, the, the fleet being downsized, when, when they're displaced, either mandatorily or voluntarily, uh, they will be part of this whole process, the uh, entitlement, advance entitlement, and or displacement process. And they'll put in their choices for what airplane they want to fly, the position on that airplane they want to fly, uh, at what crew base. And then if their seniority allows 
for that award, they'll be awarded that airplane. I hope that makes sense. I know the seniority stuff sometimes gets kind of complicated, but that's the best way that I can explain it. Uh, number three, I rewatched re Flight, the movie Flight, the other day, and the first 20 minutes is some of the most gripping theater I have seen. And yes, it is theater. As an MD-80-90 pilot, what are your thoughts on the realism of that? Not. <laughs> very, very, very little of what you see in the first minutes, the first 20 minutes of that movie have any attachment or relation to reality. Flying the thing upside down, uh-uh. It's not designed to fly upside down, and the engines would not stay running. And uh, it's just, nope. Um, landing in that field and touching down and then, you know, skidding for about a hundred feet and coming to a stop and most of the people walking away from it alive, uh, no, don't think that, um, that's the way that physics work or physics works. Uh, but I kind of gave it a pass because, you know, the movie is really not about flying. The movie is about a character, uh, who is suffering from alcoholism and his battle with himself uh, to to finally admit that he is an alcoholic and gets himself some help so that that is the theme of the movie and so because of that I can kind of look the other way pretty much on the the uh, the flying stuff but uh, yeah very very little um, relation to reality there on the movie flight Number four, I noticed on the APG site, on the iPhone, it's really hard to find back episodes to see the show notes and links. Maybe a future enhancement for that? I don't think the same issue exists from a real browser. Okay, so I thought, hmm, I didn't think it would be tough because basically the site on the phone or uh, a tablet device is the same site that you see on your desktop or your laptop. It's, um, what do they call it? Uh, Re, reactive, responsive, I think is the theme um, that uh, kind of adapts it to whatever device you're viewing the uh, website on. And so I took out my trusty iPhone 6 and went through. And uh, so I have some um, some tips for you. Um, number one, when it when it shows you the fur or the last several episodes, if you want the show notes on those episodes, then you click on either the graphic or the title, uh, you know, like APG 153, you know, hyphen, whatever the title is, click on that. And then that will take you to a dedicated page for that show. If you want to just listen to it in the browser, you don't have to go to that individual page. You can just hit the play button from there. But if you want all the show notes for that show, you got to hit the, the link to that actual page with the, with the show notes. Okay. That's number one. Um, number two, if you want to look at um, back episodes, um, at the very top, just below the title bar on the phone or the uh, tablet, there should be like a navigation menu that you don't see on a, a laptop or a desktop uh, because you don't need that um, functionality. But on a, a mobile device, the people that came up with this theme thought it would be best to have some kind of a, a menu uh, that you can select what you know what part of the site you want to go to. So there's that button there. You click that, and then you can select podcasts. And then there you'll have the first I don't know or the last 15 or 20 um, episodes. And again, you have to click on that actual episode to go to that actual page with the show notes. Uh, and then if you um, want to delve even further back, I think you can still delve deeply by scrolling and I'm not sure how far you can go back and, and again I'm not really sure that I have a search feature on the on the mobile device but uh, you could always do a search for you know just put if you're looking for episode 125 you could probably just put in 125 and it's probably going to send you to that that page with the show notes on it so that's just some advice um, let me know if that helps. Okay, and number five, perhaps a listener can be enlisted to put together clips and answers as part of a FAQ question or section on the APG site. 
I know you struggle to keep up with feedback and with a lot of duplicate feedback that that let you focus on new and things you wanted to talk about again. Okay, I've been getting better about that, trying not to rehash some of the things that I've answered in the past. Excuse me. I have had a few, uh, a couple of uh, folks volunteer to kind of uh, work on this kind of project. I haven't heard from them in a little while, so I'm not sure how that's going. Uh, but um, yeah, we, we've been thinking about that, and uh, I, uh, I definitely hope to have something like that in the future, Jay. So that uh, it's easier for people to, you know, I can send people to that, the FAQ page of the website and say, hey, that's a great question, but I've answered it many times and this is what I recommend that you do. Go here and then listen to me answer it again or whatever. So good idea. And uh, that's it. Thanks again and God bless. Jay from Johns Creek, Georgia, just up the road from where I live. How are we doing on time? We're all right. Um, let's see. Do we have time for some audio feedback from Physics John? Let's see. Hey, Captain Jeff. This is uh, Physics John. I uh, started watching your shows maybe about a month ago or so, and I just really enjoyed it. I'm a disabled Iraqi veteran who uh, actually worked for a while for... Uh, as an engineer for Pisces Aircraft on the Speedout Project and several drones about eight years ago, but I just want to tell you I thank you very much. You you helped me in ways you can understand. God bless you and your family, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful year. Thanks again, Captain Jeff. Have a great day. Well, thank you, Physics John. I think that's what you're saying, Physics John. Um, disabled. Uh, it, that was kind of hard to hear because again, that that's Google Voice, and Google Voice doesn't always have the highest audio quality. Um, but thanks for calling that number, uh, John. And uh, he said he was a uh, disabled Iraqi veteran and, um, and has dabbled in the aviation realm, which is very cool, uh, having to do a lot with the, uh, the drones in the, uh, in the uh, Middle East. And um, I, I'm blessed that you have let me know that this show means a lot to you. And it's, it's a gratifying to hear that. And um, I'm I'm just happy that I that I've been a big part of of this for you, and uh, I, I look forward to hearing more from you and your feedback in the future. So, thanks again, um, Ken Barry sent some audio feedback. Let's hear what Ken has to say. Hey there, Captain Jeff. This is Kenny in California. I have a question for you regarding the uh, TransAsia Airways 235 accident that occurred in Taipei a few days ago. Uh, the latest speculation, and of course it is only speculation, since they haven't released a report, uh, the latest speculation is that they had a single engine failure uh, during the climb out, and for reasons unknown, the, uh, the, the pilot of the controls shut off the wrong engine, shut off the running engine. And uh, I know that single engine operations uh, would be something that would be covered in training and uh, obviously something you'd be covered in the simulator. But I suppose uh, my question would be, uh, is there uh, a portion of training to, uh, that would uh, cover a situation like this where you want to make sure that you're shutting off the correct item? Is there not a, uh, a verification process where the, the other the other pilot in the cockpit would verify that you're shutting off the wrong component? You know, say, for example, in this incident, you've got one working engine and one not working engine, and you need to shut off the engine that has failed. Wouldn't wouldn't that wouldn't it make sense to have uh, have the other pilot in the cockpit verify? Uh, I guess that's about that. Um, also, just want to add, uh, I just want to thank you for uh, your putting this podcast together. Uh, I definitely enjoy it. I've been listening for about two years now. And uh, I guess that's about all I have for now. Uh, Kevin, you can keep the shiny side up. And uh, oh, yeah, Bruce, cover your ears. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Another, another truck driving honking horn event. I love it. Thank you uh, for doing that for us, uh, Ken. And uh, good question. And yes, we, <laughs> that's something I should have mentioned while covering this um, earlier in the news section that uh, 
the um, it's very very crucial, especially in the heat of battle, when you have an emergency situation that you, if there is any way to take some time to really analyze what you have, um, you need to take that time to to analyze it properly. And uh, what was that? What was it that we did in the Air Force during stand-up? Uh, uh, maintain aircraft control, analyze the situation, take the appropriate action, and land as soon as conditions permit. And uh, so, maintain aircraft control. That's paramount. Analyze the situation. That is critical. Okay. So, in this case, it appears that these pilots did not analyze the situation properly or maybe didn't take an extra few seconds to make sure that they were analyzing the problem correctly. Um, the next thing is what, that you have to be very deliberate, especially when you're reducing thrust or reducing power on an engine, and especially very careful when you're cutting off fuel to an engine, that you are actually selecting the correct engine to reduce thrust and or shut off or shut down. And our procedures, and I'm thinking that almost every airline around the world has this procedure, but it doesn't seem that it was actually utilized in this tragic accident, is that uh, before an, an engine is, at Acme anyway, before I pull an, a, a power level, a throttle, throttle lever back, retard the thrust on it, I put my hand on it, and then the person who is running the checklist, or no, actually the person running the checklist puts her hand on the throttle and says, okay, re, you know, throttle, throttle lever retard, left engine. Okay, and he, he or she puts his or her hand on it, and then the other person looks at it and goes, I confirm you are putting your hand on the left throttle, whatever. So they pull it back to idle. And then the fuel cutoff switch, same thing. Okay, fuel cutoff switch, cut off. Okay, I'm putting my hand on the left fuel cutoff switch. The other person looks at it. I confirm that you are putting your, you know, go ahead, you know, cut it off. So, uh, and that takes time, but sometimes that extra few seconds to confirm, not sometimes, every time, that few extra seconds to confirm something really, really drastic like reducing thrust or switching off an engine is extremely critical as we saw in this accident. It seems to be the case. That's what happened. So, yes, we train that. We do that all the time. And when we're in the simulators having engine failures, engine shutdowns, whatever, we go through and we practice, you know, doing the confirmation thing. So, yes, you are correct, sir. And uh, what else was it I was going to say? Oh, I was listening to the one of the latest episodes um, it may be the last or the previous to the last episode uh, of the Plain Talking UK podcast in which or on which uh, Pilot Pip from the Plain Safety podcast um, sent in a little bit of um, a segment specifically talking about the TransAsia ATR crash and the revelation that they may have turned off the wrong engine, and then he goes into some depth about, um, you know, what you are supposed to do in the situation, exactly what I'm talking about and what you're asking about right here. And um, you should always listen to that show anyway, Plain Talking USA, excuse me, Plain Talking UK, uh, Carlos and uh, Matt and uh, Simon, um, and Pilot Pip, his contribution to that show is... Uh, just a, a gem and you need to listen to that episode I'll figure out which one it is I'll put a link to it in the show notes so you can listen to it yourself I'll try to even tell you exactly where in the show pilot pip does his uh, little segment but you should listen to the whole thing regardless and uh, but he does a fantastic job of talking about this situation and making sure that you're confirming you know the uh, the, the proper action and proper item so there you go. Another plug. Another, how did that happen? Every darn time I do a show, I'm talking about the Plane Talking UK podcast and Pilot Pip's 
plane safety podcast. Oh well, I'm going to have to start charging them for that, I think. Okay, I still have a few minutes, so let me continue with this from Bruce in, I think he, this is the Bruce, I'm not sure which Bruce this is, Bruce Bowden uh, in the UK, and he says, I have a story for you, hot off the press, from the aviation world's most ignored journal, Aviation. That's A-V-I-A-T-I-O-N exclamation point, like the movie, Airplane. Just make sure your teeth are in firmly before you read the headline. Yours, belatedly, Bruce. Paper planes protracted problems persist. Ooh, that is a lot of alliteration there. Let me say it again. The name of the article, the story is, Paper Planes Protracted Problems Persist. The new Boeing night terror airliner continues to be plagued by major technical faults. A fire on board caused the revolutionary composite paper mache or pipia mache airliner to divert to Denver International for an emergency landing yesterday. Terrified passengers escaped from the aircraft by punching holes in the fuselage. Thermal runaway, which the Boeing technicians refer to as burning, was identified as the culprit. This process started in the tin foil coated combustion chamber on the number one engine and spread to the wing through the nacelle. It seems that third party manufacturers used the wrong glue to attach the foil. This is the latest setback of many that have plagued Boeing's highly sophisticated airliner. In September 2010, a worker's arm is severed in a paper cut. October 2010, a worker dies while reading the sports column of the magazine that he was molding into the control surfaces. Unfortunately, he is now part of the right aileron on the first prototype. February 2011, the first test pilot dies when he drops a cup of coffee and falls through the resulting soggy cockpit floor. And in June of 2011, the inaugural flight ends with the plane disintegrating under the fire hose welcome. I managed to interview a married couple on yesterday's flight. Mr. and Mrs. Knee Wobbler were extremely forthcoming in their answers to my questions. I asked them, even with the problems they had personally experienced, they still think that the night terror airliner has taken aviation to a new level. Uh Uh-huh, well, frankly, I just wish it had taken us to Chicago, replied Mr. Knee Wobbler. I then asked them, with all things taken in consideration, uh, do they think that it's still a game changer? Mrs. Knee Wobbler remarked, it's certainly an underwear changer. Boeing has put on a brave face amid the ridicule heaped upon their new pride and joy. They cite the airliner's unique capabilities. The Boeing 666 Night Terror is the only airliner that can land vertically in a 60-knot headwind. Boeing's chief designer looked dejected when he told me, quote, I wish I had accepted that job offer on the Dreamliner. Obviously, a little bit of uh, satire there. And Bruce, did you make up the story or did you find this somewhere? Either way, it was very, very amusing. Thanks for sending it in. Sometimes it's nice to get away from reality and uh, have some fun, have some humor. Okay, let's see. And uh, Mark Ross at Flight Level 330 sent me a link to this article. Pilot and wife use iPads to safely crash land without landing gear. And this is not a joke, by the way. Uh, Definitely a frightening way to land a plane. A pilot and his wife were forced to turn to their Apple tablets when their single-engine plane suffered a complete electrical system failure. Navigating approximately 80 miles in complete darkness on a flight between Wyoming and Wisconsin, the crafty duo utilized airspeed and altitude indicators on their iPads in order to navigate to the Rapid City Regional Airport in Rapid City, South Dakota. Of course, the lack of an electrical system meant that the pilot and his wife were unable to extend the landing gear as they approached the airport. I'm not sure why they weren't able to extend the landing gear on a Piper PA-24-250 Comanche 
built in 1959. Is there not a way to manually extend landing gear on that airplane? I've never flown that airplane, but come on. I can't imagine that you'd have to have electrical power to lower the landing gear of that airplane. Okay, back to the article. They were also unable to alert traffic air traffic controllers that the plane was incoming. According to Rapid City Firefighter and Aircraft Rescue Specialist Jerry, Jerry something, the pilot located a runway that was not used as often detailed by the flight data on their iPads and brought the plane down on the belly of the aircraft. As described by the officials on scene, sparks were shooting from the bottom of the plane as it skidded to a halt at the airport. Speaking about landing the aircraft, Rapid City Fire Department Battalion Chief Tim Daly said he had to be a super good pilot. Both the pilot and his wife walked away from the crash without any injuries. Of course, it's likely that the plane will need significant repairs before becoming ready for flight again. It's also likely that the FAA or the NTSB will have to complete an investigation of the incident before the pilot is authorized to fly again. And then they have a photo of the uh, Piper PA-24 Comanche that uh, landed gear up. So, interesting. Had to use their turn to their iPads to, um, to land safely, according to the article. Thank you, Mark, for passing that on to us. And do I have time for one more? Um, no, I think I'm going to go ahead and pause and uh, hopefully I'll be able to finish this thing up when I return. But you know, you know me, there's a good chance that <laughs> I won't be able to do the rest of the show until tomorrow, but we'll, we'll give it a, sh- a shot anyway. So, uh, through the magic of podcasting, I'm going to put this on pause and then You'll be hearing me again very shortly, and it'll be like, what? You weren't even gone. All right. Hello, I'm back, and uh, it's actually just a few hours after I said I would return. I went with uh, Jeff, my first officer, to the Stone's Throw Brewery, um, just about what nine blocks or so from here. Nine or ten, something like that. A little chilly outside, but it uh, wasn't too bad. And uh, we had a uh, Black Hops IPA, a Black Hop IPA, something like that. Really good. They didn't have any food or anything else there. It was just a, a brewery tap room or a taste room, whatever. Then we walked from there to the Flying Saucer here in Little Rock and uh, had a bite to eat. I had a eh, mediocre uh, French dip sandwich. And uh, had some uh, some pretty decent beer. And then we walked back. Just got back a few minutes ago. And I'm going to attempt to finish this episode so I can get it out sometime tomorrow, which is Friday. Okay, so let me see here. We are recording, and uh, that's good. Okay, so I'm going to continue with our feedback. And uh, that would be... Another piece of feedback from Mark Ross, and he sent me another link. It says uh, they don't check this before the flight departs, and he is referring to an article on uh, NBCNews.com, and it starts off, starts off by saying, Something unusual happened in the sky last night. A flight had to make a pit stop in the middle of the trip because one of its crew was going to go over his allowable work time forcing passengers to do a sleepover in Chicago. American Airlines Flight 223 to Los Angeles was supposed to leave Boston on Sunday night at 8.15, but poor weather there in advance of another winter wallop delayed departure, said airline spokeswoman Victoria Lupica. Lupica. According to flight tracking site FlightAware, it didn't leave until 11.22 p.m., The first officer was then going to exceed his work time, so the plane made a planned landing in Chicago shortly after midnight local time. Passengers were given hotel accommodations, accommodations, and a fresh crew was brought in. The flight left to continue its journey at 7.21 a.m. Central Time. FAA and airline regulations set limits for how long crew members may work using a formula based on when they clock in 
and how many segments they've run recently. Uh, Lubica said having to replace a crew because of exceeding work time doesn't happen frequently. It was brought about by the weather delays in Boston, she said. Okay, so Mark, your question is, they don't check this before the flight departs? Well, I don't know how United does it, but at ACME, we receive in our paperwork, um, in our flight plan addendum, a piece of information, and it's called the latest allowable takeoff time. And the computer does all these calculations and knows when we started the day or duty day, and they know how many legs we've flown, and we know, or it knows when our duty day period began. It depends on what time of day. And uh, then it does the calculation. And so, for instance, on today's flight from Atlanta to Little Rock, it says, Captain, rotation ID, Atlanta 5453, duty L-A-T-T, that stands for latest, latest Allowable Takeoff Time, um, Maximum FDP Limit, uh, today the 12th at 23.12. And then it, below that it says the latest allowable takeoff time due to or with an extension applied, and it, it can be extended up to two hours, uh, 01.12. So if I, and that's all in Z time. So 2312 minus 5 would be 1712 um, Eastern or 1612, but we, it would have been Eastern because we left from Atlanta. And, of course, we, we took off at, I don't know, 11-something in the morning. Uh, so we were well within the uh, duty period limit. But uh, if for some reason we had... A delay because of a mechanical problem or weather or what or whatever, we would look at that Zulu time maximum or latest allowable takeoff time, and then if we decided we we're going to go ahead and allow this extension, this two-hour extension, that would have been zero one twelve Zulu. So let me do some public math here. That would be twenty five twelve minus five. About eight twelve p.m. would be the last or the latest allowable takeoff time to stay within the rules. And at ACME, if we accepted the extension and we were out there in line for takeoff and we could see that we were going to be taking off after 8, 12 p.m. local time, we would turn around and we re would return to the gate in Atlanta. We would not take off. I'm not sure if that's the same normal procedure at United. And in this case, maybe somebody didn't wasn't looking at the latest allowable takeoff time and perhaps maybe en route they went, ooh, ooh looks like I'm going to exceed the maximum flight duty period limit, so we better go ahead and land somewhere short of our destination. I don't know what happened in this instance. But yes, to answer your question, we do check this before the flight departs. It seems to me that perhaps somebody didn't know that the first officer in this trip was getting really, really close to that time. And uh, another question you may be asking, well, wouldn't that apply for the whole crew? Well, it could be that because of the weather and everything else that the captain was on a had been called to come in at a later point and maybe this was the captain's first flight or the second flight or whatever and maybe the first officer was on a different trip and that first officer had started earlier in the day so it's possible that you know that it happens quite often that we are actually flying the same flight but we actually may be on a different rotation or different different uh, trip number and uh, may be doing different things every day of the trip, and you just happen to be together on that particular flight. So that is that. Thank you, uh, Mark, for your feedback. Uh, I got this from Bob in Connecticut, and uh, he said uh, he sent me this photo of him in the captain's seat of a 737, and he said, I just asked the captain if I could take a pic of the cockpit, and he insisted on taking the picture of me in his seat. Made my day. 
It's the airline that only flies 737s. You can say it. You can say that on my show, Bob, Southwest Airlines. And uh, and I do the same thing. I uh, invite people if they're coming up and they want to take a picture of the cockpit or they want to sit in the seat or whatever. And and I usually you know have them take my hat and put the hat on their head and you know it's a lot of fun and uh, I think it's good PR. Uh, passenger Ken writes. Uh, good morning, Captain Jeff. You mentioned on a recent captain's log that you used to fly into Augusta at night when the control tower was closed. Are there any airports that you, or Acme as a whole, fly into today that require you to land without the aid of a control tower? Can you describe the procedures for such landings and any special procedures they present, or special challenges they present to you as a pilot? Um, well, we used to fly into, as I mentioned, Augusta late at night, you know, control tower closed. There's still some places that we fly. If it's a late flight at night or you're delayed for whatever reason, you may end up flying into the airport that um, has a closed uh, tower. Uh, we used to fly into Bozeman, Montana, and at that point they didn't have any kind of control tower any time of the day. And then they had a part-time tower, and now I think they have a full-time tower in Bozeman, Montana. Um, I can't think of any any place offhand right now that is a, a permanent or 24-hour non-towered airport that we fly into, at least on the uh, Mad Dog. But right now, I, I guess the best way to answer this is that there are several smaller airport facilities that uh, have towers that airport towers that cr close somewhere around 11 o'clock or midnight. And if you happen to be coming in at that time or later, then you have to utilize the... Uh, I just mentioned um, in a couple episodes ago about going into Grand Rapids uh, very late at night, and I think they closed at 11 or midnight, and we had to use the pilot-controlled lighting. That's one of the challenges that uh, presents itself if you're flying into a, um, an airport that doesn't have a control tower in operation. You have to announce uh, on the common traffic advisory frequency, which is usually the same uh, frequency that the tower is using when it's in operation. So uh, the call it the CTAF, the common traffic advisory frequency. I think that's what CTAF stands for. And uh, you dial that up, and then you say, Acme Flight 451 is you know, 15 miles to the southeast and we'll be entering a left downwind for a runway, whatever. And then when you're on the downwind, you say, Acme Flight 451 is on a left downwind or right downwind at your altitude uh, at the at that airport. You always want to mention the airport itself as well because um, it's not uncommon that the common traffic advisory fre frequency may be being used at several different airports within that frequency range or the, the broadcast range of that frequency. So you want to say Bozeman traffic, uh, Acme Flight 451 established on a left downwind at 5,000 feet or whatever. Again, when you turn base, again, you make the Bozeman traffic, Acme 451, left base, runway, whatever. I don't remember what the runway designation is now. And then uh, when you're on final, again, you tell, you know, you say how many miles out you are for the runway at that airport. And then you continue to do this all the way, you know, final, short final. Uh, after you've landed, you know, you tell on the common traffic advisory frequency that you are taxiing on a certain taxiway and what your intentions are and where you're going, always to allow other people in the traffic pattern and uh, the, the airport traffic area to know where you are, where you're going, what your intentions are. And that's just for good communication so that if other people are operating within that area, they know what the heck you're doing. As I said again, you know, communication is essential in, in most things in life, all things in life, actually. So uh, what else? If you're on a IFR flight plan, which we all are, part 121 carriers here in the United States, you have to remember to close your flight plan. Now, normally that's not something we do, but if you're flying into a, 
uh, an airport that doesn't have an operating control tower, then you have to either, if, if the controlling facility, the center facility, can hear you on the frequency, you can say, hey, we're on the ground, cancel our, um, our flight plan, our IFR. Uh, if not, then you have to call a telephone number. And, or you can use uh, flight service stations. Sometimes you can contact them via the radio and tell them that you want to cancel your flight plan. Uh, but again, there are telephone numbers you can call and you let them know that you are on the ground and you've canceled your flight plan. And the importance of that is if it's an instrument meteorological conditions and uh, other people need to fly an instrument approach into that airport, you have to cancel your uh, your flight plan so that the controlling facility can allow the other flight to come in. Otherwise, they will not allow the other flight to fly an instrument approach until you have canceled. So that's another challenge for flying at an airport that does not have an operating control tower. So the big thing is making yourself known, making yourself aware of everything else that's going on, you know, listening to what's happening at the airport. Uh, making sure you're making the right decision as far as what runway to use based on the winds um, and uh, canceling your clearance, etc. So that's the big thing about flying at airports with non-operating control towers or you know after hours or whatever. There you go. Uh, Ross writes, uh, saw this on FlightAware and thought you might want to mention it in the news segment. Of course, I didn't do that in the news segment, but I can, I can mention it now, Ross. Um, and it has to do with something that we've talked about before on the show. Um, alternative ways to taxi an airplane out to the runway. And in this case, it's an, uh, a piece of equipment called the taxi bot. And uh, let's see, I think I recorded a little bit of their YouTube video here. Let's listen. Israel Aerospace Industries is introducing TaxiBot, Taxing Robot. TaxiBot. An innovative taxing system that brings practical, simple, and efficient solutions to the need for taxing with engines stopped. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Monster Truck. TaxiBot will make airports more efficient, economical, and environmentally friendly. It leads to significant savings in fuel consumption. Right. Reduction of CO2 emission. Really? Noise reduction in airport surroundings. Yeah. And will end foreign object damage to engines. Ah, oh, awesome. Okay, well, it goes on. That was just a little part of their, ooh, I love their sound effects, on their YouTube video. This was, <laughs> if you watch the video, which I'll have uh, a link to in the show notes, um, it's kind of funny because it says, it's going to be out there in 2012. Well, the last time I looked at the calendar, it's 2015, but they're still trying to get this thing out there. I guess they're, it's being tested by Lufthansa in, uh, at one of their airports. I forget which one. And uh, they're actually making some progress with this. So what is it? It's a, if you don't look at the YouTube video, I'll explain it to you. It's um, like what we call a super tug, which is a, a device that actually picks up the nose wheel of the airplane and pushes the airplane back. And then um, the super tugs that we use now, you know, the, the driver and the super tug actually drags the airplane around and takes it to the hangar or whatever that, you know, positioning airplanes and that kind of thing. Well, this, this thing, the taxi bot is a super tug on steroids. So at some point, I'm, it didn't go into all the details, but you have the, the taxi bot driver, uh, he pushes you back or she pushes you back. And then at some point you, the pilot take over the operation of this super tug. And apparently it has a way, I guess you're using your steering tiller. And when you use your steering tiller, you turn the tiller to the right, the nose wheel turns to the right and uh, something on the super tug senses that the wheels are turning to the right and then it goes, oh, okay, you want me to turn to the right. So the whole super tug thing turns to the right. And then when you put your brakes on, that slows the progress of the, of the super tug. So it's like you're still taxiing the airplane under your own power, except that instead of having the engines running, you're actually using the super tug for the propulsion. And uh, my only question is, 
And they really didn't address this in the uh, video that I remember. Um, maybe I just wasn't paying close attention. But they said that, or so you go out there, you go to the runway, and then when you're close to the end of the runway and you're getting close to takeoff, you start up your engines and you save fuel, and you save, uh, you know, carbon dioxide emissions and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, at some point you have to unhook from this um, super tug, and the driver in the super tug has got to drive that thing back to the ramp. So I don't know if they're going to use taxiways or if they're going to have special roads to get back to the ramp areas, etc. So it sounds to me uh, that like these super tugs are going to have to, or the airports or these operators are going to have to build access roads if they don't have them already from the end of the runways back to the ramp areas, the uh, the apron areas. Um, you're going to have to have a lot of these super tugs, and they, they can't be that cheap. But apparently, according to the company, um, uh, they pay for themselves over a uh, one- or two-year period. And then after that, you're, you're saving bunches of costs in fuel. So I don't know. I'm not sure if this is going to be practical or not, but we'll have to keep our eyes and ears open. I'm thinking that it might be the other solution that I've seen, and we've talked about on Airline Pilot Guide before, are the systems that are made that are electric motors, high-torque electric motors that are usually um, affixed to the main landing gear and propel the main landing gear wheels using electricity, and uh, and they and they stay on the airplane. So when you take off, you know the these motors are basically permanently affixed to the main landing gear. Uh, the downside to those systems is well, you know, first of all, the initial cost of them. Secondly, the weight of these things are probably, you know, they're pretty significant, so you're carrying around a lot of extra weight. Um, but again, you're saving fuel potentially. So I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking that those might actually be um, a better alternative, but I don't know. You know, who, I'm just a line pilot. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what would be better, but uh, that's just my feeling. So there you go. Thank you, Ross. Daniel uh, Sanchico sent a link to a YouTube video, and this is called the. It's from Aero TV, built on honor, touring heart cells prop shop. In this video, we have the pleasure of meeting JJ Frigg, executive vice president for Heart Cell Propeller. And we receive a personal guided tour Hi, of the Hartzell. Hi, I'm JJ Friggy. I'm the Executive Vice Friggy. President here at Hartzell Propellers in Piqua, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today for a quick tour around our shop. We're going to walk through some of our cells and talk about cellular manufacturing, done in one processes, and all the components that go into our propellers. So if you've ever wondered okay, what so this is, a really good example of what we is mean involved in making propellers, you might want to watch this video. Again, this is from the Aero News Network, um, and it's called Built on Honor Touring Hartzell's Prop Shop. So thank you, Daniel, for sending the link, and I'll have the link available to you, my listeners, in the show notes. Okay, continuing, we'll head over to this next piece. And uh, this is from Larry. Uh, let's see, Larry Gregory in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He writes to me, um, Captain Jeff, a, a little excitement at Tulsa recently uh, on the 9th, I think that was Monday of this week, American 3235, call sign Envoy 3235. That was one of the, it's one of the um, connection carriers for American Airlines. You can tell that they have their oxygen masks on, and uh, so he sent. He actually took the took the audio and edited edited it for me. He said heavily. Uh, it was thirty minutes long, and he edited it down to something shy of that. Actually, he sent me a couple emails. He said that he was able to find uh, where they declared an emergency on center frequency. So I'll play that one first. Uh, but um, from uh, Tulsa Daily World, uh, an American Eagle plane, actually it was an Envoy plane, traveling from 
Dallas-Fort Worth to Iowa made an emergency landing at Tulsa International Airport on Monday evening after the crew reported fumes in the co- in the cockpit. Well, the, that's not true. If you look, we'll, we're going to listen to this in a second, but he says there are noxious fumes in the cabin, not the cockpit. The airport reported the incident just after 6 p.m. And so let's listen to the initial call of uh, Envoy Flight 3235 to center frequency. Have a good day. Good day. Good day. 658, contact 4, center 135.45. 3545, except at 658. Good day. And uh, center envoy 3235, declare an emergency. We have uh, nauseous views on board. We need emergency descent down to Tulsa International, please. And uh, vectors. Envoy 3235, Roger, turn at 30 degrees left. It's going to maintain flight level 270. 30 left, 270, envoy 3235. Okay, when you're talking with an oxygen mask on, you're using the microphone that's within the oxygen mask itself, and sometimes you have the positive pressure of the oxygen flowing on the mask, and you'll hear sometimes that weird um, sound, uh, but that's a very distinctive sound when somebody is on an oxygen mask. Harker, uh, Harker uh, 189, turn uh, right, heading to 010. Right, 010, or classic 189. Envoy 3235, you put it close to the radar vectors. Descend and maintain flight level 240. Descend and maintain flight level 240, clear direct to also via radar vectors, Envoy 3235. Envoy 3235, uh, just confirm you're on a uh, U turn, you're still turning 30 left? Uh, we're in the, the turn 30 left right now, Envoy 3235. Roger, thank you. Flight 3235, you said the nature was uh, fumes in the cockpit? Uh, negative. It's uh, fumes in the uh, cabin, and uh, we have a few people uh, having a hard time getting sick. I get you. Flight 3235, continue uh, another 20 degrees left. Just going to maintain, just going to maintain 1616,000. Stand by for altimeter. All right, down to 1616,000 on 3235. Flight 3235, VO. Altimeter there is 3013. 3013, thanks. Uh, Envoy 3235. Envoy 3235, we need a chance. I need the uh, number of souls on board. Envoy 3235, your choice. I can uh, I can uh, turn you, make you let you do a teardrop uh, left turn or right turn back into Tulsa. They're laying into the north. Envoy 3235, clear to Tulsa via left turn. Teardrop will work for us, Envoy 3235. Envoy 3235, Roger. Clear to, le- clear to Tulsa via left turn. Left turn uh, for Tulsa, maintain 16,000. Left turn, and uh, I assume it's uh, 36 right? I'm not quite sure yet. Right, can you say get a heading for Envoy 3235? Envoy 3235, uh, you're clear to left turn, uh, direct Tulsa. Do you need heading? Affirm. Okay, uh, Envoy 3235, turn left heading of, uh, left heading of uh, 100. Zero zero. One zero zero on one thirty two thirty five. On one thirty two thirty five. Contact Tulsa post one two four point zero twenty four point zero. Let them know if you're heading, please. All right, twenty four zero on one thirty two thirty five. Okay, and now here is the continuation on Tulsa approach. Lindbergh thirty six forty nine planning one eight zero. One eight zero on thirty six forty nine. Sir, I'm going to uh, widen you out just a little bit. I've got an emergency overhead the airport with the uh, RJ, and he's coming down. I'm not sure exactly where he's going to go, but uh, we'll get you in reference in. And Bert 3649, just going to 2,500. I think I can get you in ahead of him here, so we'll go ahead and get you in here in just a second. Okay, we'll go down to 2,500 on my 3649. Approach on with 3235, uh, turning 100, uh, 16,000. Envoy 3235, Tulsa Approach. Good afternoon. Fly heading of uh, 160, just going to maintain 5,000. Currently 36 right. All right, 36 right. Uh, 160 down, heading down to 5,000. Envoy 3235. Lindbergh, 3649, turn right, heading of 220. 220, Envoy 3649. And uh, Approach Envoy 3235, if you could have crash fire and rescue, uh, meet us at the gate. Uh, we've got some medical emergencies on board, please. 3235, we'll go. Envoy 3649, you'll be able to keep it in close. Yeah, we'll keep it in tight on the 3649. 3649, or sorry, Lindbergh 3649, to maintain 2,500. 
2,500 will be 3649. 8,100. Test, Windows 3649, the airport's at your uh, 1 to 2 o'clock in 6 months. We do have a sign, will be 3649. 3649, clear visual approach 36, right, keep it in close to our 121.2, good night. 121.2, we'll keep it in close to our 3649. Envoy 3235, just advise when you're ready for the base turn to the airport rep at your altitude. Alright, we'll, we'll call the base. Just set up your visual, uh, 36 right. Zero, proceed to standby positions for runway 36 right. 235. Envoy 3235, roger, turn left setting as a zero six, uh, make that uh, zero seven zero, and you can advise when you have the airport in sight. 070, Envoy 3235. Yes, sir, if you'd like, I'll give you a vector on to the localizer if you want it. This should work. There he is. 50, we got a confirmation. Souls on board 69 or 69. Fuel 8,100. And they are requesting medical personnel at the gate when he comes out. 4235, just set to maintain 3,000. 3,000, I'm with 3235. Two vehicles on echo. 110 on the heading airport will be 11 o'clock in one, three months. Alright, zero one zero, Envoy thirty two thirty five. Yes, sir, Envoy thirty two thirty five. Let's make that rollout heading three six zero. Alright, three six zero, Envoy thirty two thirty five. Five six, what's the to three six right? And do you know what gate uh, they're going to be parking at? One hundred. Tell you what, uh, make a one eighty and exit Golf One. We're going to get one more departure out before the emergency aircraft comes in, and he's taxiing out now. Turn like three six right. This is three six right, Envoy thirty two thirty five. Six sixty two. Expedite to 36 right for departure. We do have an emergency aircraft inbound. We're trying to get you off prior to his landing. Envoy 3235, contact Tulsa Tower 121.2. 1212, Envoy 3235. 3235. Roger, one departure party left, Envoy 36 right. We're going 36 right, Envoy 3235. Marker for Envoy 36 right. Directly to uh, Euler for Delta 875. Delta 875% pilot's discretion maintain 4,000. Discretion 4,000, Delta 875. American 1035, connect Fort Worth Center 132.2, good day. 32, 2, American 1035, so long. 135, call with 3235. Do you know what gate we'll be parking at? Uh, we're going to be clearing and uh, stopping and popping doors, and hopefully Crash Fire Rescue will meet us there. Uh, first word we got from the center was one of the uh, waiting at the gate, but uh, we'll plan on uh, uh, doing exactly as you said. Of 500. And also, how did you copy that? The three mile final right now, I've got an emergency that's about to land on 46 right. And uh, you should be able to clear. It's not a mechanical. He's got smoke in the cockpit, so uh, hopefully it should be clear. I just wanted to correct you just in case. Okay. Interestingly, it's it's funny how it's kind of like the, the game Telephone, where you know, one person tells another person, tells another person what's happening. And apparently along the way, it went from, you know, noxious fumes in the cabin, which is what they're experiencing, to smoke in the cockpit. So, you know, it really is important that we communicate better in these situations. But uh, anyway, so uh, let's continue. Thank you. Uh, from North on 375. Uh Looks like uh, they've advised the uh, tower that they're actually going to stop on the runway so they can pop the doors and uh, um, ventilate the airplane because it's back in the uh, cabin now and it's causing some problems with the passengers. So I'm going to find out if runway A426 is available. Also have 36 left available if you'd rather have that. The winds right now are 0503. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, maybe slow down, make a little time, and uh, get a plan B together. Yes, sir, that'd be great. That's smart, the uh, Delta flight, to uh, start coming up with some alternative plans. And it's very likely that uh, on this night, it was probably really great weather, and that Delta flight probably didn't have any uh, alternate fuel or anything else and weren't expecting anything like this to happen. So you never know. 35, uh, they're checking you down the runway uh, right now, and the crew off you right there will be uh, uh, whatever you'd like to do uh, right there. That's the one of the uh, for 3235, want to change to uh, ground point nine or there will be uh, uh, 3235, go ahead. And approach Delta 875. Uh, plan B, uh, our first uh, choice would be runway 8. Okay, so it, it continues. And uh, remember that these are uh, audio 
recordings from live ATC. They're from scanners. Uh, these aren't just isolated frequencies. These are um, approach control frequency, tower frequency, I think also ground control frequency. So there's a lot of stuff going on that you would not normally hear if you were actually on these frequencies. So um, I know many of you are probably saying, how can you keep up with all this communication? It just doesn't sound even coherent in the least bit to me. And that's because, again, we're listening to several different frequencies at the same time. So uh, anyway, they landed safely. They um, ended up uh, having the uh, crash fire rescue people meet the airplane. They pulled off the runway so they, they did not close the runway. And uh, every, it was a happy ending. Um, there was also a, a piece of video that uh, Larry sent in, and this was from... Uh, one of the passengers put this on Instagram. Let me list, let you listen to this. It's Jabril, I'm in Tulsa. We just had an emergency landing. I guess we were losing pressure or something. I was asleep. I, I didn't know. Okay, so this guy's perspective. This is Terrell. Uh, they just landed. They had an, an emergency landing. It must have been some kind of a pressurization problem. I don't know. I was sleeping. So I'm not sure uh, what the crew communicated to the passengers, if anything. Um, I would think that uh, if it were a pressurization problem, he would have said something about the oxygen masks dropped, which obviously this didn't happen, I, I guess. I don't know. I wasn't there. Anyway, so that was on Instagram. Um, and then just the last thing I'll do in, in this recording um, is a little kind of a a funny little occurrence that uh, happens occasionally. Uh, you are um, making your public address, your PA, to the passengers, and uh, you don't push the right button for your transmission. And uh, sometimes over the radio frequency, the communications frequency, you hear something like this. 36 fast speed on our way to Minneapolis. Anticipating a very smooth ride. Glad to come see both high for you. Over the last YC, keep the seatbelt secure with acid. Okay, so at that point it just stops. Uh, probably the other person flying with that guy goes, uh, like, you know, giving him a sign, like, you know, you're on, <laughs> you're on the radio, not the PA. Um, uh, but I don't know about you, but I didn't understand hardly anything he said. <laughs> um, let's listen to this again. Okay, 36,000 feet on the way to Minneapolis, expecting a very smooth ride. Dude, you need to slow it down and you need to talk more clearly so that your passengers can understand what you're saying. Oh, boy. Okay, well, there you go. Thank you, Larry, for uh, taking all the time and effort to find that audio on FlightAware, uh, excuse me, liveatc.net, and actually taking the time to uh, edit the audio and save me a lot of work. I really do appreciate that. So, um, again, that was uh, from Larry D. Gregory in Tulsa. Oklahoma, a little bit of excitement at their airport. Somebody dropping in unannounced because of an emergency landing. And uh, turns out everything worked out just fine. I guess they said that um, they never did. Let's see. Once the plane was on the ground, fire crews investigated to try to find the source of the fumes. Um, Lupica said later that the aircraft mechanics were examining the plane to determine whether there was a mechanical issue. But that's all we have on that, and probably all we'll ever get on that one. Um, again, thank you, Larry, for that. Alex writes, uh, he, um, how about testing them before hiring? And the, he's referring to the TransAsia ATR pilots being grounded after uh, busting those mandatory checks or tests by the, uh, the uh, regulatory um people in Taiwan. Good question, Alex. Good question. 
Um, I think we'll end this with um, our friend Vernon, uh, retired at CFI, and uh, he is in uh, Fort Morgan, Colorado. We've heard from him many times. And the last time we heard from him, he was having some trouble figuring out how to get the ringtones on his phone. And so I appealed to, and he appealed to, the APG community to help him out with that. And we had several kind of give some assistance, and here is the result. Good morning, Captain Jeff. It's Vernon in Fort Morgan, Colorado, calling to say thanks to Dispatcher Greg for the lead to Zedge the Android app to download for ringtones. I now have the, they call it the airplane chime or the seatbelt chime and anytime I get a text message I get the double dings and an opportunity to look around and say time to fasten seatbelts. Thanks for your podcast and the APG community. Keep up the good work. God bless. It wasn't me, Vernon. It was the listeners, the part of the community. So thank you to everyone who helped out Vernon. And Vernon, thank you for continuing to listen and, and, uh, and contribute to this whole thing that we call the Airline Pilot Guy Show. And uh, if you want to learn more about me and the show and the community and the coffee fund and different ways to listen, to watch, etc. You want to look at some of those links that I have talked about in the show and you want to see the show notes, it's all over at AirlinePilotGuy.com and uh, until next time, wishing you a great weekend, a great week and uh, hope to see you again uh, next week and uh, as always, wishing you clear skies and limited visibility and tailwinds. Take care and God bless. Good day.